Right. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. So we'll first start with our introductions, uh, and then we'll go into questions. Uh, so my name is Amit Lingare. I'm the director of data science at Nobelis. Uh, for those of you who don't know Nobelis, we are the one of the largest uh, aluminum producers in the world. Uh, we make uh, aluminum cans, uh, we supply uh, aluminum to car manufacturers, uh, also to airline industry, both Boeing and um, Airbus are our customers. Um, so we are a global company in uh, 13 countries, 30 plus plants, and we started our digital journey uh, about three and a half years ago, and I was hired to kind of lead that data science team. So I have three uh, areas under me, I have machine learning, I have constraint optimization and simulation. And uh, in the last three and a half years, we have built a team, uh, ground us up from zero to 16 people in the team right now. And we focus on those three capabilities. Um, have done upwards of $50 million of value. Um, so I'm very proud to say that um, because we meticulously capture our value and it gets measured and approved by our finance team. So that's about me. I'll pass it on to Phil. Yeah. Hi, I'm Phil. My name is Phil I'm Vice President of Costco Holdings and I'm in charge of our Manufacturing R&D Center. For those of you who doesn't know the Costco, <laughs> Costco Holdings holds uh, about 30 affiliated companies, but the major one is the Costco steel maker. For instance, uh, around the one of the 10 cars use our the steels. And then, uh, more information is uh, Costco was awarded by the World Economic Forum as a lighthouse factory. This means that uh, we have uh, successfully adopted the post resolution technologies, and my team is working very hard to make our factory smarter uh, using AI every day. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lena Walker. I'm a uh, product manager at Sama. So, Sama, we do data labeling, data integration, and I guess like the reason why I'm here is like I get to see all the customers that are doing AI, so we can see like the different use cases. Um, they're applied in manufacturing and also other industries, right? Um, but like we focus on computer vision, so I I would love to share a little bit more about like the future of how to use like computer vision for problems that are more complex and cannot be solved without that piece. Excellent. I am Samson Mutari, Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer for Jumps and Controls. So we're a multinational um, in multiple verticals, so from industrial HVAC equipment producing uh, to making buildings smarter, healthier, uh, to having security solutions uh, from seamless access to biometrics to facial recognition and retail solutions for shopper analytics type of services. So everything in between operating on over uh, 90, 95 countries or so. So uh, lots of multi multiple jurisdictional stars involved in what we do. Hey, I'm Tenzu. I am the VP of Customer Solutions at London. Um, probably haven't talked much about all this out before, but we're an AI solutions company out of South Florida. And we really focus on helping our clients motivate industrial solutions from an end to end perspective. Uh, that can be from the data collection, then ultimately to the analysis, whether we're using models that we've already developed or models that we develop custom for our clients, and then ultimately getting that into operation uh, you know, through a variety of integrations and development and operation of industry. That's great. All right, so let's get to our questions. So AI in manufacturing, it's a very broad term, right? It has everything from predictive maintenance to robotics to inventory management included. Where do you see yourself, uh, or where do you see AI making impact in your company? And yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times where we see, um, just one second, all right. Come on up, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me on this? It's just not my day with microphones. <laughs> uh, all right, so what we see a lot with AI is, is really around the predictive uh, maintenance for a lot of the equipments um, that, that our clients have. So um, whether that's automating in, uh, you know, in, in inspections, whether that is really increasing the routes and readings, whether we're using robots like Spot that you guys all saw earlier, fixed cameras, drones, it's really about how can we automate this process to collect the data and then ultimately analyze that data to make better decisions. A lot of our clients, um, they either, you know, they really come to three different spectrums, right? They, they already have all of their, their, their equipment that's currently sensorized, they different types of devices on it. 
Then the second group would really be around, they just have their key critical pieces of equipment, and they have many that just don't have, have anything. And so it's, it's a very manual process where they literally have somebody walking around every hour, reading engaged, and, 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 and taking notes on that. And so, so how do we help them really start to understand, okay, can we automate this and take that person and put them onto something that's much more you know, productive with their time? But as you can imagine, this is really kind of that first step with the ad, right? We're, we're, we're really looking into what is descriptive by nature. The goal then is that once we capture all that data is to really have them then move up the ladder to be much more predictive and prescriptive in what they can do. Um, another core area really around AI that we see a lot of is around safety, keeping people, you know, humans out of harm ways, um, whether it's the conditions, you know, the environments um, that the employees are working and, and sending something like a robot in ahead of time, or whether it's starting to detect different um, indicators of where, where somebody shouldn't be. So those are some of the big core areas that we're seeing a lot with AI. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 and possibly as an analyst, I kind of sat down just to kind of write what are some of the things we do, and I literally came with the laundry list, and that's probably half of what I know that AI is being utilized in, right? So from, for us, I'll kind of split it into two areas. One is facial recognition side. So one facial recognition side, we're using AI to power um, power AI using technology that have access to uh, access controls for it. So where we can empower seamless access with facial recognition technology without having to check in at a security desk or whatever. We know uh, in certain use cases, if you walk in, we know what floor you should be on. And elevators open automatically to that floor. And, and, you know, next step of checking if the HVAC system is uh, ambient to the number of occupancies uh, in, in that in, in that building down to be able to look at, you know, um, on our uh, we have systems where we have automated decision making that has autonomous usage of, of you know, without any human intervention. So think about it in, in security system situations where there's a backpack left in a park, um, our system will be able to analyze that there's an anomaly here that should be there to be able to uh, cause awareness and, and drive and whether it's from car formations to um, Occupancy counting, so there's a situational awareness. That's on the facial recognition side. And then on the building side, you know, we use AI to uh, what we have our platform called Open Blue that really enables commercial products so that accelerates um, um, the, the reduction of carbon footprint from the defense team on the grid um, using our systems, using our technology, right? So, in, in using that, that you know, that case scenario is right now kind of exploding for us, particularly on the ESG route, where we're able to not only um, create a more energy efficiency solutions for buildings, but really show the actual counting of the carbon um, uh, elimination. But so possibilities are, are you know just growing exponentially for us. Maybe I could just add an extra that we see that can turn the use cases is a little bit more around the. Um, the robots that you can have like inside and helping with the different parts of the process. Um, I'll love to talk a lot about that because that's pretty much everything that is around 3D and sensing. But um, we've seen like for example how they're making port leaves, how they're moving around, receiving the environment, um, and that's at least one of the use cases that I'm most excited about. Yeah, for us we have focused on four main areas of operations. Uh, how do we basically keep our machines operational? As long as possible, so predictive maintenance. A typical uh, hour of downtime is pretty large value in our industry. So that's a very big use case. The second is how do we reduce defects, right? If you can basically reduce defects uh, through AI, then you can perhaps make sell more, right? The third is um, reducing the cost. So a raw material is a very big cost, and as aluminum prices going out of the roof, that's basically becoming even more important for us to reduce that cost. And the far final is throughput, right? How do we make more from the same amount of time? So those are the four main areas of operations where we are focused on. And uh, one common thread that I would say that we have used in our AI implementations, as I mentioned, we have done about 30 uh, use cases so far, is uh, how do we augment the human decision making using AI, right? So if you look at typical shop floor where an operator makes a lot of decisions, right? They look at using their sensory perception, they look at some certain things and start or stop the process of or they hear something and then they take action based on that. Well, can AI be used to augment those decisions, right? 
So as an example of a very successful model that we have, which has been now employed to like uh, four or five plants, is where we basically predict the entry parameters of a machine to the operators and give them as recommendations. So those entry parameters were basically largely in the past done by operators based on their experience, knowledge, intuition, right? They would look at how the coil came out from the previous machine, uh, how it looks like, they would, uh, and then where the, in the current meal, where the roles are, and then they would kind of like do mental calculations and then create the parameters. Well, what we have done is now build a machine learning model that actually does the exact same thing and use the recommendations on the screen. And now they can they just have to like use our recommendations and um, we have seen that when they use our recommendations, they were able to cut down the defects by 80%. So, so things like that where you could actually think about um, anywhere operators look at certain things you can think about computer vision. Okay, can we use computer vision to augment their decision making? So there are plenty of use cases where AI yeah, can be used in operations. Maybe, maybe, um, yeah. maybe I can add some this by trick cases because in Costco, we have been building the this by twins in, uh, for the last three years. So then we classified the, the development phase into three, and then we are in the second stage. The first stage is just uh, converting all of our the factory models and machines and human models into the 3D world. And then the second phase, uh, we are connecting the, the old signals, sensor signals, and then the, the protein spacing uh, information so to these with the 3D model. The third phase, what we want to implement is bidirectional. Uh, the reason why we are building up the digital twin is for bidirectional uh, experiment and uh, execution. For instance, when our customers want a new size, Steel or new, or new uh, steel with different materials. What I have to do is that we have to do some on some test uh, test uh, uh, test experiment on. We have to put it into the real production line, which makes it very long time over one month to meet the customer's demand. If we have these like twins, the story is a little different. We perform the simulation on the these like twin, and then. Uh, uh, take it back to the, the real production lines and make it much faster to react to customers' needs. So this is, a, but in reality, uh, implementing this data is in a very detailed level. It's a very, very challenging. What I'm surely I can uh, share the exp uh, experiences very interesting. Okay. That's great. Well, so we talked about use cases, but with those use cases, there come challenges, right? So we might talk about what are some of the unique challenges you have faced in implementing AI in manufacturing. Yeah, I think um, it's related to the first question as well, and everything that you're talking about right now is that it's all about like getting the data, right, or getting the right data um, to feed into your models. And if we think about like the manufacturing, like, there is a lot of existing data that you can structure and like build models upon, right? Um, structuring and connecting everything will be key, and getting there, it's kind of complicated. Um, it requires a lot of processes, and I'm pretty sure that this guy's are doing an excellent job of that. But then there's the extra step, right? What is the data that you don't have? So we can talk about computer vision in those cases. Like, how do we want to leverage computer vision to acquire that data that you might not have? If you're thinking about the whole process from the beginning of the production line until the end, like, how could you maybe use sensors or, like, I don't know, LIDAR, for example? Um, to be able to see the volume or the things that are like moving around. Because maybe that extra level of data, I think the presentation that was before, he was talking about that, how like the future computer vision can help. He wanted to get like videos so he can identify people or he can identify how people are moving and ensuring that everything was in healthy space, right? But if he doesn't have that video or that liner with a right object tracking method or like object detection model, there's no way that you can actually get that. So I guess one of the biggest challenges is actually augmenting, like increasing the data that we could have like inside of the buildings and in within like the whole process so that then better models can uh, optimize other places um, on the production. And then as part of that data, um, I think in manufacturing is a little bit less of a problem. When you think about other industries that like there's a lot of noise in the data, it's more complicated, but because e manufacturing is kind of like a closed environment, it is always the same way. Like the data is actually in, in good shape. It's easy. I, I would say it's easy, of course, yeah, it's extremely complicated, but it's much easier to, to build models upon this like more structured environment. 
um, and ensuring that you're optimizing also the whole process of acquiring data, labeling the data, knowing what are the needs of your models, so you don't have to go through that process multiple times is also a big challenge. Or at least like on the data labeling side, what we see a lot is people will go in, have requirements, get all the data labeled for computer vision, then come back and realize that the requirements were not good enough. They were missing one piece of information or another one, and they have to go back and label everything again. So it's really about being optimal um, about like that data position, data labeling to fit into your models. That's great. We have one slide. Yeah, the one thing that I would add to that is uh, you know, definitely plus whatever the you should say there with the data and the quality of data and all that. Um, a lot of times, and this goes across many industries, but I see a lot in manufacturing, is really the um, getting the right uh, stakeholders in the, the business to actually get this when we go to operations. Um, a lot of times, you know, in, in these types of environments, it's somebody that has been doing this job for many, many years. And so the idea of bringing in new technology, their first thought is really around, this is just one more thing I'm gonna have to do. You know, so instead of instead of augmenting and making my life better, this is just one more thing I'm gonna have to have to deal with and, and there's gonna be problems off the bat. You know, and I, I've been working on these machines for 50 years, I know exactly what we're gonna do. So it's really important to make sure that it's not just this AI team versus this, you know, kind of the, the operator team. It, it, it really from the Round up. So even when we're starting, you know, identifying the right use cases to begin with, and moving to you know a proof of concept and bringing them along for that journey is definitely something that can set up for better, better success. That's great. And I really love that comment. Like we do in our data platform have AI too, right? And if the AI model is not good enough, there's no adoption. Yeah. So you have to have a strong uh, model enough or adjust the user experience around it so that they don't lose adoption or they don't stop using. Yeah, that leads to my third and next question. Is actually some of the critical success factors that actually kind of give you success in manufacturing when you implement AI, right? And um, I'm going to take that question first. Um, I would say, based on our experience, um, I would say three factors that actually helped us or um, lead the foundation for our success so far. Uh, the, the first one is, I think, uh, the previous speaker talked about that. Uh, is uh, focus on the value, right? <clears throat> when you identify use cases, you have to find use cases that produce value, right? And then you have to get that value quickly. So what we did is we actually flipped the entire circle of data or AI modeling, right? In the past, and I, I talked to many, uh, many conferences or many uh, companies, and what I see is they focus on like getting the data right into their data lake, and then they start building use cases, AI use cases. What I think we learned is, if we go that route, we won't have any use cases for two years, right? Because data is very messy and it takes time to get that data in a central place. So we started going to the source where data exists, just do a graphic cleanup of that data, and then start building the use cases right there. So show the value real quickly, and that way you can get the executive adoption and uh, support behind you. Because they all care about value. So if you can kind of like meet them in the middle and, and do what they want, that helps to get that adoption. The, the second is when you build, uh, and in our, our case, I'm part of the center of excellence uh, team that we have set up. Uh, and when we, originally when we kind of started doing use cases, of course we didn't have the talent in house. So we had to hire people with skills from outside uh, and, and we started doing use cases. But one thing we learned is we, just to keep on doing use cases and not get the very winning organization with us, it's going to create that uh, maintenance or sustainability problem, right? So in addition to doing use cases, we started doing a lot of upskilling efforts in our clients. So we started running digital academies uh, for people, and I'm proud to say that we have now 300 people actually trained on using these tools, and many of those people actually are doing use cases themselves. So uh, very similar to the previous speaker, there are certain functions where people are doing use cases all the way to like building complex machine learning models. And in some, some cases, they are just kind of like largely doing district analytics. But we have kind of like pushed the organization on that journey, not pushed, but we have kind of like brought them along with us. Right? And then the third thing I would say is when we started the journey, we realized that change management is a very big uh, obstacle in adoption. 
So you have to focus um, on it from the very start, right? You have to find approaches and strategies that basically help you to overcome that hurdle. In, I'll, I'll give an example where we had this one model, we deployed this model and um, we saw very good success. But the moment we left, no one wanted to use that model, no one wants to go uh, and uh, use our recommendations. So in that case, we had to go back and um, find a champion within the plan who could basically uh, adopt the model. So we had this one shift uh, manager who was like, okay, I'm good, you are trying your model, but uh, don't judge our performance based on your model recommendations, right? So we had to work with the plan manager to remove those kind of like evaluation of uh, that particular period from their performance, right? And once we did that for a month, with that shift particularly used that model and saw very good outcomes, we were able to actually showcase that to the larger organization and say, hey guys, look, when they use this, we saw like 80% reduction in this particular defect, right? Uh, and that basically helped us to bring some of the uh, other shift managers along with us. And it's a journey, it's never a one, one second, like you do it and you get it done. So it takes time, but you have to kind of keep moving on that path. Anyone wants to add on that? Surely, um, I totally agree with that. But excuse me, the second part, paper. The paper is critical yeah. in adopting AI for specific for the manufacturing, the domain. You know, unlike the Google, or Amazon, or Microsoft, or uh, which is a digital native company, but manufacturing company, you know, their measures really depends on their the products like uh, mythologies or. So they know nothing about the AI, and they are not familiar with the digital transformation. AI and this big data, right? So we have to, first we have to ask the, the employee, hey, do not write down that data into your Excel or into your specific application. Do not hide your data in your desktop. Please collect all of the data into the centralized repository. So we have, for instance, if we, if I, based on my personal experiences, when I talk about our the country's IT people, uh, let's let's shift it from the database <coughs> to data lake. And the question I um, and then question I got is that what is data lake? They don't know. Really, seriously. <laughs> and this uh, so how about the use of the cloud? And what is the cloud? So this is the first step. So we have to, as you mentioned, uh, we have to provide the education program first to uh, spread the, 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 the meaning of AI, why it is used, we have to educate them first, and then raise the, the engineers uh, with some AI backgrounds, and then give us some goals to each department. It should be, well, unfortunately, usually it should happen in a way from top down. The CEO should have a strong decision. Let's go to that. Let's use the AI and spread it from the companies. And then give a goal to the, the NDO of everyone, and then in this way, the people was the, for me the people was most critical in making successful. I love that, and I think a mix of both of those uh, things is critical, right? Like you do a phase of prototyping or testing, you prove what is the value, you gain forty percent of efficiencies, and then you have to go up to the CEO and be like, we can get forty percent of efficiencies, trickle that down, like it's so that everyone will start doing that, right? It's the same like with, uh, with our processes, so we implement the model, we are expecting 20%, 30% efficiency gains, but if we are not really pushing down on like, we expect that with this model, if you get 20% like more efficient, then nothing happens because they're not gonna change into like something new just because of the change management. But the other sort of thing that I would just like to add is be careful with like building models, right? Because it's so easy for the engineers to over-engineer stuff. And that has multiple problems. Like one will be the resources that you need. Imagine you have like this gigantic like model, huge parameters, and like the amount of resources that you need to put. And you look into profit and loss, and like at the end, like the cost of running that, and like multiple times, it can be very complicated. And you really have to think about all those things like before you start building it, because otherwise, all those like I don't know, one year of R and D will go down the flush because yeah. they'll have to go back and figure out a way to make it much more efficient. And then they end up with a much simpler model um, that didn't take that much time to build, that performs pretty much similarly, maybe a little bit worse, but then we just tweak a little bit of the interactions to make it better. Very important point, yeah. So the session I'm going to come to you because your role is very unique on this panel, right? And I'm going to kind of combine two questions into one. 
So what is actually about democratizing data, right? And making people use it and, and build insights. But on the other hand, there is a question of like data privacy, right? Um, how do you how do you address those two paradigms? Yeah, no, it, it's becoming um, it, 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 it's increasingly becoming a not just a challenge internally, but also an external posture, particularly for those that are before it's more of a CB uh, CB. Uh, sorry, but now it's uh, becoming a uh, be a huge concern for B2B. So, for, you know, from from a particularly a multi-jurisdictional perspective, you know, think of in our space, think of we're in smart cities, we're in connected buildings, um, we're doing industrial IoT. So we're talking not just access to the most cost restrictive confidential data, but sensitive public data, but we're talking about manipulating the data, um, creating capabilities from the data, and before our customers share this data, now with, as, as regulations have become so contentious and data transfers, particularly multi uh, uh, multiple jurisdictional transfers, have become so contentious that it's become challenging for the customers are starting to ask, how do we know this, we can create trust and confidence in your ability? So from our perspective, if this requires a global operational framework, you know, when, whether you're addressing security and privacy, you have to have so we've heard the moniker security by design, price by design. It has to be built in from the ground up of creating these products and services. And you, know, you must be able to show where your data is at all times, what's collected, why it's being collected, um, what the retention schedules from this framework are. And when you answer these questions, it becomes even easier, you know, particularly when you put the AI principles that a lot of regulations are popping up and creating from a fairness principles base to explainability. These questions, when you have these processes built in, it becomes easier to create the guidance, right? Um, so in, in our in, in our situation, having this imperative being built in from the ground up allows us to kind of create you know, very specific data points to be able to say, hey, here's exactly what's happening. So when due diligence occurs, we're able to show, we're able to show a data map scenario, we're able to show what the sub-processes are. We're able to show um, who and where this data is residing, what the local jurisdiction and expectations are, what our legal data transfer capabilities are, and that starts to be, be leveraged in these scenarios when, you know, in regulations such as in Europe, we have things such as the Data Act that's popping up. It's changing the, the cloud provider's behavior. They're having to re-evaluate how they operate in Europe uh, around data sovereignty, around um, uh, around interoperability to data localization. Uh, no, this is a data act. So this is a this is a new thing. So um, you know, from Microsoft, particularly Microsoft is taking a huge initiative. Google's coming on board now, and Amazon is doing it. So, but uh, what the expectation is is that within Europe, these markets they want you to have um, access to what you're doing with with the local competitors, so they can plug in. Right now, that creates a momentum and shift. And when you're looking at AI. Like you, have to, you have to be able to say, well, where does the line draw, right? Where can I have interoperability, but does it get into my IP of what I'm doing for that customer? So you have to kind of strategically think and incorporating privacy by design, incorporating security by design allows you to kind of have that knowledge, break up that uh, capability to be able to say, okay, well, these regulations pass, this is what we'll do, this is what our game plan will be in order to have that interoperability. So just Having it, not doing it as a one-off approach, is going to be huge and it's going to pay off in volumes once you, you integrate this. That's great. Um, Dan, you talked about robotics, right? Can you talk about like, how robotics is making an impact um, in the industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's clearly so many areas that we could, we could talk about specifically with, with robots you know, in, in the manufacturing space. So um, I just really want to highlight kind of on the, on the spot one. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a really you know, innovative and, and Forward thinking, you know, way that businesses are currently using uh, to run inspections. So, as you guys have maybe seen or not seen, but to be able to use something like a spot robot from Boss Dynamics, you know, think about this amazing mobile capturing device that can literally go anywhere in a facility, that can run these routes on a regularly scheduled basis, collecting a ton of data. Um, you know, whether we're using computer vision to be able to detect a gauge and to convert it to from analog to digital whether we're using object detection to look for very specific pieces of equipment and layer on different um, thermal anomaly detection you know, 
different models, whether we're you know adding different types of sensors, you know, for for gas detection or you know you name it. The ability to to instead of equipping every piece of equipment in a facility with some type of a device device to take just as one or two mobile robots and to be able to capture all that on a regular basis. And and these are things that will just happen scheduled. You know, so you know we have we have you know over a dozen clients that are actually using this on a, on a day to day basis. And it's not just re taking somebody who is currently doing those tasks and putting them onto something else much more efficient. It's actually collecting data that they've never had before. And so when they start to use that with some of the other data that they already have, it really allows them to, to, to push the needle on really what predictive maintenance can look like. Great. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable with you with a lot of, uh, that's a very interesting question. So sensors are basically creating a positive change uh, in the industry. Can you talk about how AI is used with sensors? Yeah, I, I think it's perfectly paired with the question before. Because like we have like the use cases where you have like uh, a robot like moving around, right? The only way that they can move around is that they can perceive the environment. And for them to perceive the environment, they need to have like a fuse of information, which is called like sensor fusion. Um, I think key like elements or like data points that you can get from that will be all well, images so you can have like 20 cameras like surrounding you can use lidar so you can have lidar will be light beams that will pretty much detect everything that is around with perfect precision which i think that's that's the key aspect about lidar is that you can know exactly where that object is so it's about the pose so for example that chair I can see with my two eyes and I can predict like certain like depth of where that chair is, but with the liner I can know exactly where that chair is because it calculates the distance through a lot of like smart things that happens with that light. But um, I think the key element on um, like the sensor space or like how sensors are adding value to it is that if you think about computer vision that is like only 2D images, you can try to predict where that object is but it's never gonna be as perfect. So for example, if I am in this like room and I know that that chair is there, I might have an error margin because like the chair is like far away, so if my annotation is not perfect, the chair might stay there. But if my chair is that far away, then that my centimeters of like quality change will mean that it will shift like that, right? So it's very important for you to have like a good sensing or like a good data point for you to know where the objects are. So if you have a robot, for example, that is like moving around, if it's trying to capture data like far away, that's when like longer range sensors, like lighters that like can go 200 meters would be extremely important. But then you have all the other type of sensors that I'm not necessarily the most expert at, but like you can have ultrasonic or any other like type of sensors that you can connect together in them, like sensor fusion. And then that piece of information, as I was saying, can all go back to your data lakes or like your smart and connected systems to really augment and bring much more powerful to the manufacturing. And I'll add just one thing to that. That's, exactly, that's one of the things we've done. And we have a thing called a BDS, Vibration Detection Systems. And it's been incorporated into these major boilers, chillers to do predictive maintenance analysis. Yes. Where the moment we know if something's about to go down, we can sense algorithm and based on this we can know exactly what part of the fucking machine is, is going to be problematic and doing this preemptive analysis and preemptive maintenance allows us to keep it running more efficiently for the customer and at the same time avoid the major costs that happen once it does break on crash but absolutely we're seeing that kind of and then add that to the bigger system of our um, platform where we can see how this is being leveraged it, 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 it adds volume. It is a uh, emergence of a term called AI as a soft sensor. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that right now, but uh, I would say if you are interested, Google it up. It's a pretty interesting uh, area to invest in. All right, so I'm going to basically move on to my uh, next topic. Um, and this is, I think, somebody asked a question in the earlier uh, session about the org structures, right? How if you're going to start an AI effort, right? How do you push to set your org structures? And um, I think I would say, if I take that question, um, my, my personal belief is um, there is no one answer that fits all, right? Every organization is different, right? Um, but in, in many of the large companies, typically when you start this initiative, the talent is 
kind of sparse, right? Or it may be in certain pockets, right? Um, so to create the discipline, create standards, create um, more rigor, uh, my recommendation would be to start with a centralized team, so maybe like a center of excellence. Um, and that team's goal is to basically do two things. One is to show value quickly, and second is to establish standards, governance, and best practices for use cases. Once, as, as you start maturing, as you start um, becoming um, kind of, um, you start creating more and more value, uh, a couple of years down the line, you start, you should start kind of permeating that capability within your plants, within your regions, right, however you want, however you're organized. In our case, we basically hired a uh, data scientist in our plants now, so in a few of our plants, we have people who actually report to plant manager and have data science capabilities, so they actually handle local use cases. Um, so the, the, the plan is to basically start permeating the capability inside the organization and reduce the dependence on your central team, right? So when they make themselves efficient, it could be using certain accelerators that you can actually either build or buy. Uh, in our case, we actually build our accelerator in-house, but in many cases, uh, people can buy as well. So that's kind of like uh, one uh, our experience. If anyone wants to add anything on that, no. Okay. All right. So let's move to the last one. Um, this is a very important topic. Uh, we'll, uh, we can talk about that. Worker safety is a very big thing in manufacturing. How can we have the use of that? Um, well, worker safety and the AI is uh, very important. Let me give you some example in South Korea. This year, South Korea has launched the act. Let me see. Um, the act on punish severe disasters. This means that uh, if an employer, uh, if someone, some employee uh, got hurt or died, like uh, two times a year, uh, as a CEO, uh, could be jailed. Seriously. And this is an uh, inact uh, in South Korea. And this becomes that all employers are keen to keep to their uh, workers uh, as safe as possible. And AI, why AI is important? Well, AI is a sort of practical and a scalable solution to protect the workers. For instance, uh, guess what? In Costco, we have uh, like a 30,000 30, CCTVs around, around the site. And we cannot assign the, uh, the, the uh, agencies to watch the all CCTVs together. But uh, see, AI is the only way to analyze as, much, as many as CCTVs and then detect some weaknesses there. And a lot of the, the managers to watch out for uh, the workers' safety. So we are actively looking into the smart CCTV technologies. But, and my team is actually working in our the postcode, the, the safety control team. What they ask and ask, okay, we have already over all the existing commercial solutions, but their answer, their question is that that's not intelligent enough. So what they ask and ask, and maybe uh, we should uh, look for more information, not only from the, the video sources from the CCTVs, but we look uh, into the, the work of the information to identify the job time. Maybe we look over the two parts meeting information to where and who is working, working that job. And then we may even check the work, uh, workers and health status all together. So uh, in my team, we are developing uh, what we call the complex uh, event recognition systems. And then what in, in reality, so we are using sort of a CEP, complex event processor, uh, in combination with the deep learning technologies. And the problem is that AI needs big data and disaster cases are very low cases, uh, just a number of few cases. So, I suggest to the South Korea government to initiate the group uh, to, you know, the, to work together to collect our disaster cases and develop the system together. That's uh, what we are working on. Well, uh, that's pretty much it from this panel. I hope you found the uh, session useful. Uh, when I joined, actually, you know, people ask me, how can AI be used in manufacturing? Well, if you are part of this panel, you understood how it can be used, right? So, thank you for all the panelists.